everybody, welcome to the Holiday Christmas Podcast. We got a great show for you today. We've got the top 10 Christmas songs, and we're going to talk about the most memorable Christmas gifts. So give a warm holiday welcome to Jim and Jeremy. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Jeremy, where are you? I'm here. I'm here. Are you at an autograph show? No, no, no. I hear I'm a back, lot of, finally. I hear a lot of people. <laughs> I, I think you're at an autograph show. It does sound like a convention, doesn't it? Okay. <laughs> We're here. And this is our holiday show. <laughs> Actually, we're going to start off with, uh, we have some seasonal beers we're going to start with. Beautiful. This is a brewery called O'Fallon. Oh, I've not heard of that one. I, I have the box here. Of course, our listeners can't. See. But this like is like a cookie tin. Cookie tin. Assortment of cookie beers. Okay. And this company is from, or this brewery is from, I think, Missouri, if I can read here. Oh, man. I don't know if they're known for their beer. Yeah. Okay. Maryland Heights, Missouri. Oh, we'll find out. Mike has my flight glasses. Uh, we were doing some... That jerk? We were doing some... <laughs> we were doing some beer. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We were guessing beers. That's what we were doing. Oh, fun. Last week, so... So this first one is Vanilla Wafer. Oh, that sounds delicious. Okay. We're going to crack it open. Okay. Here we go. Oh, hopefully I don't... Even heard a little hiss there. That was nice. Good touch. Good pour. Makes you know it's genuine. Okay. Jeremy can pour his own. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. If I can figure out my way around the mic. I love how you give it the sniff test. Am I finishing this thing? You can. Okay. Mm. That one tastes pretty good. Yeah, I can't imagine this would be bad. Vanilla wafer. Okay. Oh, yeah. You can taste yeah. the vanilla. <laughs> I wanted to start off talking about uh, you too. I know it's not holiday. Oh, me too. But uh, hold on one second. We're having problems here. Uh oh. Are we not recording? Oh, there we go. Oh. Okay. We had a problem uh, with the last podcast. I lost the entire first part. Oh my god. So hopefully we don't lose this one. <laughs> no, that'd be awful. There was a recent article about you too. Uh, Larry Mullen Jr. He's having surgery. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you. I did see this. They're not saying what, but uh, it seems like it might be like something to do with his hands, a wrist. Right. And U2 supposedly is going to have a Vegas show. And Larry said they'd have to do it without him. Oh, man. Or if they went on tour. Right. So my thought was, why don't they get Bonnie Carlos? <laughs> <laughs> He's not doing much. And I think it would be ironic because one of the things with Bonnie. When he left Cheap Trick, there was uh, something over, there was a fight over them playing in Vegas, having a, what do you call it? Uh, it's not a stay, Vegas, like a show. Mm -hmm. And I think Robin and uh, Rick, at the time, they had younger kids and they didn't want to commit to being in Vegas for that long. So I think it would be ironic if Bunny did the vegas show even though vegas will tell you they're a big family location now <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> family destination mm -hmm. so the other news is that uh there is an album a new album coming out i forget the name of it now i do too but i did see that <laughs> and i'm excited for it it's songs of you know something because it's been a few years <laughs> for them hasn't it yeah what i'm excited about is maybe bono heard us but to go with his book there's an album coming out called surrender Mm. And it's 40 stripped down U2 songs. Mm. Bono's all right. Have you seen, have you ever, we probably talked about this before. Have you ever seen U2? I have not. They're oh, okay. on my bucket list. Okay. That's one that I'd love to go with someone like you, someone who appreciates their music yeah. because they're like one of my five favorite bands. So just not at Lincoln Financial, Phil, because that was the last time I saw them and sound was awful there. Ooh. Yeah. Good to know. We're going to talk about the top 10 Christmas songs. I don't know if you had any other music stuff. The only th thing that I wanted to kind of mention, I don't know if you saw, but Taylor Swift is touring next year. Oh, okay. Did you see those ticket prices? They're insane. Yeah. Let's, let's just put it that way. They're insane. 
Yeah, I've heard of. <laughs> <laughs> I was a- I was looking, and you know, even like the cheapy seats were like 150 bucks, and it's like, oh my god, man. Well, there was this big thing with Ticketmaster. I heard about that as well. Yeah, where it shut down the site or something. Yeah, but what can you expect? She she had all top ten songs on <laughs> the top ten, and then it's funny because I mentioned Drake of all people before. I think it was the week before Mm -hmm. that maybe Drake, I said Drake didn't put out an album. I mentioned someone else. And of course, Drake puts out an album and knocks Taylor Swift, except for the number one song. Right. So that was weird. Yeah. It's funny because we're going to talk about our memorable memorable gifts. Mm -hmm. That text you sent me about Taylor Swift just owning the top 15, that will be a memorable text. I will never forget that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was like 14 out of 15 songs or something. I think it was all 15 from her album. Yeah, it was was insane. Yeah. So I pulled this list from Billboard, and it's from last year. I guess I could have looked to see if they had a new one for this year. And... Jeremy, do you have your list in front of of you? (laughs) I don't have my list in front of me. I did listen to it. Let me see if I still have it well, saved. I, I can go through the the top 10. There it is. I always have notes. It's it's still up on my phone. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't surprised by the top 10, but there was like two or three that surprised me. We'll get into it. And I think these go by sales and streams. Uh, some older songs, mostly probably sales. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you never know. I mean, I just saw that, uh, you know, people have been posting their Spotify uh, yes, listens. this is all over the place. And Queen had an insane, it was like 2.3 billion streams. Wow. Queen. I'm not surprised. A lot of people like Queen, whether they admit it or not. Yeah. I love Queen. Absolutely. Queen's a fantastic band. But around this time of year with the holiday songs, I know at work I have a... I have a pretty good playlist. I think it's like 30 hours. <laughs> wow. All Christmas? Yeah, okay. Christmas. And uh, it's... Any, any Hanukkah or Kwanzaa songs in there? No, no. Okay. <laughs> so I, uh, I have that on shuffle. So, of course, every time... Now I listen to Apple Music, uh, but, of course, it's counted as a, as a stream. So I'm sure a lot of people are streaming a lot of Christmas music this time of year. Absolutely. So you want me to go through the list? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Go for it. Number 10 was one of the ones that shocked me, by the way. I like this song. So do I. And it's uh, This Christmas. Not to be confused with Last Christmas. <laughs> it's This Christmas. Yeah. Donny Hathaway. I don't really know much about him. I mean, that could be his only hit. The version I like is there's a guy named Boney James. He's a saxophonist. Okay. And he has a Christmas album. And I've had that album for a long time. And that's the version I know from gotcha. that album. Gotcha. Donny Hathaway was uh, a late American soul musician, so he's no longer with us. Uh, it was released in 1970. Mm-hmm. And the song gained renewed popularity when it was included in 1991. I'm sorry, included. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Included in 1991 on Atco Records' revised edition of their 1968 Soul Christmas compilation album. Uh, it was recorded at Audio Finisher's studio on Ontario Street, that's pretty specific, uh, in Chicago in the fall of 1970. And what, what people don't realize, or maybe they do, is that a lot of Christmas songs are really not recorded in December. Uh, we have a couple on this list, we'll find out, were recorded in the summer. Because you want to get it, you want to get it uh, re- recorded, you know, put together and, and released before, you know, before Christmas. So. Right. Rick Powell, I guess he's one of the guys that worked with Hathaway, was very, said Hathaway was very upbeat during the session and that he knew what he wanted to do musically and the impact he wanted to make with this, this song regarding the representation of African Americans in Christmas music. Uh, It was released as a single in 1970. It was listed only once on any Billboard magazine's weekly published music charts in the 1970s. Wow. Uh, It was on Billboard's special Christmas singles chart, uh, week ending December 23rd, 1972, and it was at number 11. Uh, But in recent years, the song has made it onto a number of Billboard's weekly music charts. 
So we have to say this list is not actually I, I correct myself because this is not the top selling. This is a list by the staff, if I recall correctly. Right. Billboard. So these are favorite Christmas songs. Uh, we have number nine, and we talked about this. I did go back and listen to our last Christmas podcast just to make sure <laughs> we try not to repeat ourselves, but people are still listening to the, our Christmas podcast from last year. Oh. So anyway, number nine is Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. Santa Claus is coming to town. This is my favorite version of the song. Yeah. And we both love this song. Uh, it was written by J. Fred Coots <laughs> and Haven Gillespie. Uh, the earliest known recorded version of the song was by ban banjoist Harry Reeser and his band on October 24th, 1934. Wow. So the song goes way back. And it was sung on Eddie Cantor's radio show in November 1934. Uh, it became an instant hit with orders for 500,000 copies of sheet music and more than 30,000 records sold within 24 hours in 1934. <laughs> so that was the only way you could find music was the radio, of course. There was no TV. Right. Can you imagine? <laughs> no TV, no cell phones, kids. It was a very, uh, very depressing time, I would think. No. <laughs> well, you had music, so. Yeah. Uh, it's been recorded by over 200 artists. Uh, Bruce's version was recorded on December 12th, 1975, at CW Post College in Brookville, New York, by record plant engineers Jimmy Iovine and Tom Panunzio. Bruce often, uh, when he's touring in November, December, he will end, end the show with this song. So that's pretty cool. Uh, number eight, we have Run DMC with Christmas and Hollis. Mm hmm. I remember when this came out, you know, especially the video on MTV. I don't. came out the year I was born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is a single by Run DMC. It was included on two 1987 Christmas compilation albums featuring various artists. It was a very special Christmas mm -hmm. and Christmas rap. Mm -hmm. uh, when Bill Adler first asked Run DMC to contribute to a very special Christmas, the first in a series of various artists compilation albums, uh, it was produced to benefit the Special Olympics. They refused. <laughs> right. I guess they just didn't want to do a Christmas song. Yeah. After Bill, who was then the director of publicity for Rush Productions, which managed Run DMC, gave the band the idea for Christmas in Hollis, they changed their minds and agreed for it to be on the album or to record it. It was produced with Rick Rubin and was originally released as a single in 1987. So the title refers to Hollis, Queens. Uh, it's the neighborhood in which they grew up. And it also samples Clarence Carter's 1968 holiday song, Backdoor Santa, not the Bon Jovi <clears throat> version, which we heard a little bit of, you know, last holiday podcast, as well as Frosty to Snowman, Jingle Bells, and Joy to the World. Wow. I like that song. That's a good one. Doesn't get played all that often. Yeah. So it's kind of that was one that was kind of surprised made the list, not because it's not worthy, but more mm -hmm. because you don't hear it all the time on the radio. Yeah. At least I don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't hear it a lot. There's one the number one song you hear all the time. <sighs> you know what's great about holiday songs is like I like I like Christmas and Hollis, but I don't think I could just listen to it over and over either. Right. So it's nice once a year to give it another you know, listen or two. Mm -hmm. So number seven, we have uh, Jose Feliciano. Feliz Navidad. I dislike this song a lot. Feliz Navidad. Say it 15,000 more times and you'll there, cover Do you know the about the parody song? Uh, Police Got My Car. Police Stop My Car. Police Stop My Car. There we go. Yes. <laughs> That's a great one. Too. Yes. Yes. What is Feliz Navidad, Jeremy? What would you know. think it would mean? I, I would think it means we, we want to wish you a Merry Christmas. It's actually just Merry Christmas oh, okay. in Spanish. <laughs> yeah. So this was uh, written in 1970. Jose Feliciano, was, he's a Puerto Rican singer, songwriter, and he says he recorded this song while feeling homesick at Christmas, missing his family in New York City and his extended family farther away as he sat in a studio in Los Angeles. He remembered celebrating Christmas Eve with his brothers, eating traditional Puerto Rican foods, drinking rum, 
and going caroling. And it was expressing the joy that he felt on Christmas and the fact that he felt very lonely. He told that to NPR in December 2020. So he said, I miss my family, Christmas carols with them, and I miss the whole Christmas scene. So we got number six, moving this, right along. This is a good one. Brenda Lee, rocking around the Christmas tree. What do you think of when you hear this particular song? We were just talking about it earlier oh. with the, the Funko Pop. Oh, Home Alone? Yes. Mm -hmm. The first time the bandits come up to the house, he's got the house all jumping. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't yeah. know, that, that always comes to my mind when I hear it. I this. haven't seen that movie in a while. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about Funko's uh, little segue. They're making all these... Different, unique just scenes. I gotta stop buying them. It's, it's like drugs. They're addicting. <laughs> My friend Ken, who I, I have a new name for, Professor of Music, Ooh. Ken Val Jr. He sent me a photo of all his Funko's. Wow. It's like, it's at least 200 nice. Funko's all on top of each other, you know, in the boxes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. So anyway, the Home Alone one is the, <laughs> they're making the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a whole scene on the stairs uh, with, you said, Kevin on the, uh -huh. at the top. Yep. And you said paint cans. Right? Yeah. Yeah. With the wet bandits at the bottom. Yeah. And I think you might even see one of them getting hit with a paint can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and those are about 50 bucks, I think. Yeah. Unfortunately, those bigger ones get yeah. pricey. They're all pricey, really, but. So we're talking about Brenda Lee. Yep. <laughs> From 1958. Uh, I just love the 50s Christmas songs. Anything from the 50s, you know, like Elvis, Jackie Gleason. Yeah, I think, I think the biggest difference with this song in comparison to like Elvis, Bing Crosby, Jackie Gleason, this is a very upbeat Christmas song. It's, it's mm -hmm. very alive throughout the whole song. And that's not a knock on anybody else, but a lot of Christmas songs are slower or just... You sit around kind of the Yule log, the fire, mm -hmm. just listening to something very kind of mellow. This yeah. is not that. <laughs> yeah, I could listen. I could listen to this over and over. Yeah, uh, and her voice, Jeremy. Do you know how old she was when she sang this song? Mm -hmm. I'll say in her teens, but she was probably. She sounds older. I don't know. You're right about her teens, but. Believe it or not, she was 13 years old. Wow, I would have never imagined. Yeah. Now, this song was written by Johnny Marks. Johnny Marks wrote Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Yep. And he wrote Holly Jolly Christmas. Okay. Too. In a 2019 interview with the Tennessean, Brenda Lee recalled that she had no knowledge as to why Marks wanted her spe specifically to sing it. Actually, she says, I was only 12... And I had not had a lot of success in records, but for some reason he heard me and wanted me to do it. And she said, I did. And she says, it's a rockabilly song. <laughs> it was a perfect choice. Mm -hmm. And number five, we got Bing Crosby, mm -hmm. White Christmas, 1947. This is a great song. Mm -hmm. It's very mellow. You know, I, I don't want to say it's boring, but it's just kind of like a one steady beat. Yeah. But it's, it, it's just, it kind of locks you in i guess you could say it's mm -hmm. a very relaxing kind of kind of song yeah i liked this song since i was a kid which was a long time ago mm -hmm. and irving berlin wrote this song famous songwriter uh it was written for the musical holiday inn uh i'm not sure i don't it might not even be in white christmas uh, yeah the movie oh no it was okay it also was in white christmas but it was first in uh, holiday inn in 1942 uh, the composition won the Academy Award for Best Original Song at the 15th Academy Awards. Wow. And since its release, it's been covered by many artists. Now, the version sung by Bing Crosby is the world's best-selling single in terms of sales of physical media, with estimated sales in excess of 50 million copies and 100 million total sales. So the first public performance of the song was by Bing Crosby on his NBC radio show uh, in 1941 on Christmas Day. And the song established that there could be commercially, commercially successful secular Christmas songs. The song initially performed poorly. It was overshadowed by Holiday Inn's first hit song, Be Careful, It's My Heart. Huh. Uh, I don't even know that song. 
But by the end of October 1942, White Christmas topped the Your Hit Parade chart. And in 1942, Crosby's recording spent 11 weeks on the top of Billboard charts. I think uh, they're saying in this movie they thought that would be the song that would, gotcha. you know, uh, be a hit. And it eventually did become a hit. And this was also in White Christmas, 1954. And that film was the highest grossing film of 1954. Now, the version uh, that you hear today is actually the 1947 re-recording of the song. The 1942 master was damaged due to frequent use. <laughs> so, I, I, I don't know, I guess because the radio shows, maybe, they used the master, hmm. the original. So, he did re-record the song in 1947. You ever wonder, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you there, but you ever wonder, like, when an artist re-records a song, if you didn't hear the original version, you mm. ever wonder if it's any different? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you'll never know. Uh, right. And it's just, it, it's kind of an amazing little factoid mm -hmm. in a sense to, hmm, I wonder if it sounded like that or if mm -hmm. we got a better version or did we get a worse yeah. version and we don't even know it. <laughs> well, that's the thing with, uh, with movies. When you hear that someone auditioned for a part and you know the person that, it's a famous movie, and you, all you know is that, but then you're like, hmm, I wonder, would it have been worse? Would it have been... Because, yep. like, what comes to mind is the movie Grease, and Henry Winkler mm -hmm. was supposed to be Danny Zuko right. in Grease. Right. But we know John Travolta. Ends up getting That's all we know. Yes. I feel with that, it, it wouldn't have been as good. Right. <laughs> Him being on Happy Days and... Mm -hmm. Although John Travolta was on, you know, Welcome Back, Cotter. So, <laughs> who knows? Number four, we have a song I really don't like. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this one either. And this is Wham! Last Christmas, yep. 1984. My wife loves this song. She loves George Michael and Wham! So, it was originally released in December 1984. Uh, it was as a double A side on Epic Records with Everything She Wants. I guess was on the other side. It was written and produced by George Michael. So this song began in 1983. Uh, George Michael and Andrew Ridgely were visiting George Michael's parents, and it was written by George Michael in his childhood bedroom. He played Andrew Ridgely the introduction and chorus melody, and Ridgely later called a moment of wonder. And then the song was recorded in August 1984. But George Michael played all the instruments on this song. I didn't know that. Yeah. Hmm. So when it was originally released, it spent five consecutive weeks at number two on the UK singles chart. It was held off the top spot by Band-Aid's Do They Know It's <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> which is a good song. Which George Michael is also on. Yes. I love that song. That's like an all-star band, isn't it, Band-Aid? There's like 30, 40 different people in yeah. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's great seeing that video because those were the musicians at the time, the singers, anybody and everybody. Yeah, I think we talked about that last yeah. year too. Now, this is what's amazing. This this song had many chart runs uh, for this song, you know, every holiday season. But it didn't hit, it hit number one. And I can't figure this out. <laughs> uh, on New Year's Day 2021. Like you would think maybe when he passed away that year. Right. But why... Why in 2021? No idea. All of a sudden, it was number one. There had to be some... It had to be in, in something, I would think, you know, in the UK. So number three, we have Nat King Cole, the Christmas song. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the greatest Christmas songs ever written. I don't know. I enjoy this song quite a bit. I, for the longest time, I actually thought this was Bing Crosby. Don't make fun oh, okay. of me. <laughs> <laughs> So in 1945, Robert Wells and Mel Torme wrote this song. Now, this song was written in July during a blistering hot summer. Oh. So in an effort to stay cool by thinking cool, they wrote this song. And this is amazing. Uh, Mel Torme says, I saw a spiral pad on Wells' piano with four lines written in pencil. Hmm. They started chestnuts roasting, Jack Frost nipping. Yuletide carols, folks dress up like Eskimos. Mm -hmm. They weren't looking to write a song. They weren't writing lyrics. 
they were just trying to come up with things to make them feel cool. Mm -hmm. Those are the first four lines of this song. Right. So that's amazing. It took them 40 minutes to write this song. It's pretty quick. (laughs) Yeah. So Nat King Cole Trio first recorded the song in June 1946. So Nat King Cole recorded this more more than once, actually. Um, There was a second recording made uh, in August. You know, he recorded in June and August. And he again recorded this song in 1953. I guess he just loved this song. Uh, he used the same arrangement with a full orchestra, and it was arranged and conducted by Nelson Riddle. And he recorded it once more in 1961 uh, in a stereophonic version with another full orchestra. But Nat King Cole's 1961 version, the last version, is generally regarded as the definitive version. And in 2004 was the most loved seasonal song with women <laughs> aged 30 to 49. I don't know where they got that. Hmm. And the original 46 recording was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame in 1974. One of my favorite versions, though, and hopefully we don't get in trouble, but I'm going to play it, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think this person does a good job singing this. Behold. Ah, uh, beautiful. Ah, uh, that's beautiful. Mr. Chicken. It's beautiful. That's my favorite version. It sounds like, you remember those little kazoos you got at like oh, yeah. Chuck E. Cheese? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that sounds like a little kid doing that. Oh, uh, that's beautiful. That's one of my favorite versions. <laughs> so now we move on to number two. Oh, before we move on, uh, oh, just kidding. Two and a half. Still. Yes. So, Jeremy, do you? Okay, Mel Torme, right? He was one of the writers of the Christmas song. Uh huh. Do you remember that he was on an episode of Seinfeld? Yes. Okay. I do. So he was. <laughs> he. <laughs> it's such a hilarious. It's it's bad because. You know, you shouldn't laugh at this stuff, but Kramer, go, he has some dental surgery mm-hmm. and he has too much Novocaine. Mm-hmm. And Mel Torme, he's um, <laughs> doing a benefit for the Able Mentally Challenged Adults, yes. the AMCA. Yes. And he... Uh, he thinks Kramer. <laughs> he brings Kramer as his guest of honor. He thinks he's mentally challenged. <laughs> yeah. And Mel Torme sings uh, When You're Smiling to yeah. Kramer on that. So anyway, that's Mel... Mel Torme, the same guy well, that wrote Christmas Song. What's funny about that episode is, even though he's not on the Novocaine by the time he's at the show to be the guest of honor, mm-hmm. what was it, the Jimmy, I mm-hmm. think, <laughs> punches him in the face, uh-huh. <laughs> gives him a fat lip, and so he's <laughs> yeah. you know, back in that state again. <laughs> so number two, we have Darlene Love, Christmas Baby, Please Come Home. This was... Originally sung by Darling Love and included on the 1963 seasonal compilation album, A Christmas Gift for You from Phil Spector. This was one of the songs that really surprised me. Mm-hmm. Not only that it was in the top 10, but it, that it was this high on the list. Well, like we said before, th- this is the staff of these yeah. are their favorites. Yeah. yeah, no, for sure. But we thought we'd do something a little bit different. Just top 10, you know. Of all the... Christmas songs that are out there, this isn't one that I would expect yeah. to land at number two, yeah. personally. And it was written by Phil Spector and two other people, Ellie Greenwich and Jeff Barry. Upon release, the song did not find commercial success, but in later years, it's gone on to become a Christmas standard. Uh, it charted for the first time on the Billboard Hot 100 in 2018 and has since peaked at number 16. <laughs> so it didn't even get on the top 100 until 2018. Right. It says in 1963, Spectre decided the song was strong enough to warrant a non-seasonal version and wrote a version titled Johnny, <laughs> Baby, Please Come Home, I, which Love also performed. <laughs> and in 2009, Phil Spectre recorded yet another version called I'm in Jail for Murder, Can I Please Come Home? And the answer was no. I'd made that up. Oh, I made that. I was very, very confused. Okay. Yeah. Get it? I'm in jail for murder. And... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Do you know about Phil Spector? Um, he was in jail <laughs> for murder. Uh, <laughs> I, guess, I guess the joke went right over my head without yeah. that tid- tidbit of info there. Okay. 
Yeah, he murdered a woman at his house. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And I think he's since passed on. So. Gotcha. Uh, so, of course, the song's been covered uh, most notably by M- Mariah Carey, Michael Buble, and U2. Yeah. And U2, I think it's the best version of that song. No uh, bias. And they recorded it during a sound check. Ooh. In 1987, in Glasgow, Scotland, okay. during the Joshua Tree tour, and it was officially released on a very special Christmas uh, that same year. Next, we have we have number one. Oh, we could just skip that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have. You've probably never heard of this song. Well, here I'm gonna. Uh, I have another person singing this. Oh, good. Yeah, that might make it better. So this is the number one song. <laughs> Sounds better already. Wait till you hear the chicken hit the high note. What? It's coming up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. That was, in fact, Mariah Carey. No. I'm sorry. That was Mr. Chicken. By the way, Mr. Chicken, uh, if you go on YouTube, mm-hmm. I actually got permission from Mr. Chicken to, <laughs> to use those songs. <laughs> I know we used him last time. Yeah. Yeah. He gave me permission. Written consent. He said, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Use them. So this is the most overplayed Christmas song in the history of Christmas. Yes, it is. I don't know if you know this, Jeremy, but even Jesus was whistling this song way back when he was doing carpentry work. I heard that. That's how far back this song goes. Yeah. And also, Mariah Carey is now known as the Queen of Christmas. Oh, Jesus. You know, Bon Jovi, he, he tried to get the title of King of Christmas mm-hmm. with his version of Backdoor Santa. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, that song has only generated $25.38 in sales since 1997. <laughs> I'd look that up. So... You got you to, gotta, you know, have a little bit more money generated before you consider the king or queen. Mm. Now, Mariah Carey has made, don't fall off your chair, maybe you know this, but she's made over $72 million on this one song. Oh my God, Jeremy, you okay? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Yeah. So from 1994 until now, $72 million, one song. Mariah Carey's worth, I think, three hundred million. Yeah. So almost one third of what she is worth is on one song. It's crazy. So, you know, I'm knocking the song. It's not a bad song. It's just too overplayed. Yeah. Now, when I was in a band back in the '80s, uh, like twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My dad, who never listened to music, I'm serious. Uh-huh. He wasn't in the music. He said to me, son, you should write a Christmas song. Every year you'd get money from that song, you know, if it was a good song. Right. And that was, like I said, he didn't listen to music, but he knew these Christmas songs get played every year. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I went into podcasting and (laughs) here we are. Well, you know, so sorry, I'm going to get a sidebar here for a second. But if you think about that statement. And then you think about that song, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. Oh, yeah. That guy couldn't sing to save his life. Mm -hmm. And he made a ton of money off of that song. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So it's not bad advice. You never know what's going to hit, you know, or what's going to be a hit. Yep. Now, at the time, 1994, not many people were making Christmas albums. According to Mariah Carey's songwriting partner, they were living together. So I don't know if that was probably her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Walter a f- a f- a fanas a if I said that wrong, I probably did uh, so he said it wasn't a known science at all back then, and there was nobody who who did new big Christmas songs, so they were like, we're putting out a Christmas album, no big deal. So the writing of this song, uh Mariah Carey decorated the home she shared uh oh, she didn't share the home with him, sorry uh. With Tommy Matola, I remember that name. Yeah. That was her boyfriend. She was trying to get in the holiday spirit. So it was recorded in August. 
And it took uh, Mariah Carey and her songwriting partner a total of 15 minutes to write and compose this song. Wow. That's impressive. That is. I mean, one of the biggest, whether you like it or not, all you're you, going to hear it. All you need is 15 minutes and you become a multimillionaire. You know, you're going to listen to this podcast and you're going to go out, you're going to be grocery shopping or at the post office, and you're going to hear this song. Somewhere. There's nothing you can do. Absolutely. So that's our top 10 Christmas songs by the staff of Billboard. I was going to say, it's actually Last Billboard year. staff's top yes. 10. <laughs> so we're going to crack open another beer. Oh, good. I'm getting a little bit more lively now. I know in the beginning. I'm itching like, for this beer. What's this like, one? This is Snickerdoodle. Snickerdoodle. All yeah. right. Yeah, you definitely want to finish off yeah. that vanilla wafer. So we only have one glass here. Not that we're sharing. We're not sharing one glass. We have we two have, glasses. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one glass each. We have two straws. That's, no. yeah. <laughs> well, before we get into this, I want to mention that Jeremy has a new podcast he's doing. Oh, thank you. He's cheating. Oh, this sound. This is good. Yeah. Yeah. Both of these are good. So and, far, this box has been. Well, good. let me let's talk about the beer first. So, um, <laughs> yeah. now the uh, there's a brewery in town, um, Butzville. And they made a snickerdoodle last year. I'm hoping they have it again. So they'll have seasonal beers. Mm -hmm. And it tastes pretty similar. You know, if you know the, if you ever had a snickerdoodle mm -hmm. cookie, mm -hmm. as a beer, it's, yeah, really good. Not bad at all. No, one thing I've noticed about both of these beers now, there's not like any funky aftertastes, which yeah. was kind of a concern of mine when you start getting sweet, mm -hmm. you know, when you mix that with beer. And but. this is only 4.8. Hmm. And it's a lager. Both come highly recommended from me. Jeremy has a new podcast. Yes. I don't know if you want to tell people or you want me to. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter. My, <laughs> my friend Kristen and I, um, we do a lot of horror conventions. So we just decided to start our own podcast and yeah, mm -hmm. kind of seeing where it goes. We, we got to talk about Jim a couple of times in our first episode. <laughs> we didn't get to talk about our chiller theater experience, but... That was what the first episode was about for, for us. and just gonna Yeah, talk. the last autograph show I went with with Jeremy. Yeah, a lot of fun. Parsippany. Yeah, but we're just going to talk conventions, movies, horror. So We we did run into this guy from uh, American Idol. Yes. Constantine. Maroulis. Yeah, and he was wearing <laughs> the tightest. I wanted Jeremy to mention this on his podcast. <laughs> He's afraid to, but he was wearing the tightest white pants. I've ever seen. I didn't notice that, to be honest. And it reminded me of Jimmy Fallon that, you know, I got my tight pants on. Uh-huh. I should have sang that to him. But <laughs> he was a little aloof. We I were hoping know. to catch him perform that night. It didn't happen, but... Yeah, he told me he was performing that night. I don't know what happened. They cut him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He didn't make the cut. For uh, Gina Shock from the Go-Go's. We house? did see... See, we should talk a little bit about the concert we saw. Yeah. Uh... It was Artemis Pyle, mm -hmm. original drummer from Leonard Skinner. Yep. He did some singing. Uh, I don't know if he normally sings. I'm not too familiar other than, you know, Leonard Skinner. But Gina Shock came on stage. We saw her sitting outside the, uh, it's in a hotel, so, it was, you know, it's like a convention room. Yeah, she, she was just kind of off to the side of the stage. Yeah. Her first song she said she learned was Give Me Three Steps. Uh -huh. And she came on and, and played that yep. on the drums. So that yep. was pretty cool. That was real cool. And then there were some other schlocky bands. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some sound issues. Bob Eubanks was there too. That oh, was yeah. Bob cool. Eubanks <laughs> from the Newlywed Game. He, they did a version of the Newlywed Game. Yeah, he did a raunchy version yes. of the Newlywed Game. Yes. That was. Very nice. You know, I was amazed at how quick-witted he was and, you know, how sharp he still was mm -hmm. for his age. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's got to be like 85 at least. Yeah. But it's always a good time at these shows because you do see some of the people that are there to sign autographs showing up maybe later at the bar. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw Chaz Palminteri mm -hmm. uh, from Bronx Tale, yeah. and uh, he was standing around, but he left soon after and I was afraid to talk to him. We saw Brad Savage. Yeah, two guys from uh, Salem's Lot. Yeah. Lance Kerwin, Brad Savage. Uh, we saw Elliot from E.T. I can say Henry Thomas was Henry hanging Thomas. out in the room. Yep. Yeah, walking around. So that yeah. was cool. That was a lot of fun. So anyway, Jeremy does a podcast with his friend Kristen, and uh, it's called Horror Con Lodge. And uh, they also have a Facebook group. Because when they did the Facebook group, uh, I think that's with two other people. Yeah. Two other administrators. Or... Yeah. 
one now, but two initially. Yeah. I think I asked Jeremy months ago if he was thinking about doing a podcast or he should do a podcast uh, about horror movies. He might have been thinking about it before then, but no, him and Kristen, they've known each other a long time and, and it's a it's a good conversation and I'm looking forward to, to more of them. So look look it up, Horror Con Lodge. Lounge. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. Did I say Lodge before? Yeah, yeah. Horicon Lounge. Uh-huh. That's L-O-U-N-G-E. There you go. Yeah. And you know, my buddy Mike is actually in a band. Okay. He doesn't play as often anymore, mm-hmm. but he's very, very active when it comes to music. So okay. next time we're hanging out, feel free to chat music with him because he knows his shit too. Oh, we should have him here. We should interview him. I bet he would love to do that. Yeah. This is Kurt Ryle from the Grip Weeds, and I'd like to wish Jim, Mike, and Jeremy a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, man. So now we're going to get into memorable Christmas gifts. Ooh. Now I have a list here. I think Jeremy's it's probably in his head. It is. I've been looking forward to this for a while. <laughs> so a lot of mine are ones when I was a kid. Uh, Most of mine are as well. And it's not an extensive list, but these are memorable. Mostly are dolls. No. Uh, Six Million Dollar Man doll came out around 1975, so it would have been like nine, ten. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I was looking this doll up because I forgot. I also had this Oscar Goldman, who was another character, Six Million Dollar Man, his boss. Uh, but there was an evil Oscar Goldman. It was a robot, hmm. not a functioning robot. But he had like two different faces. Like you could take his face off. And then you could put Steve Austin's face on him. <laughs> so he would disguise himself. And that was probably from one of the episodes. And apparently it was called Maskatron. How oh, cool. <laughs> I didn't know that. Now, a lot of these toys I had, I wish I had kept, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. Probably like a lot of people that are, you know, my age or even younger than me that had dolls or I, not dolls, but toys. I can relate. Yeah. I mean, a lot of this stuff blew up in value if, mm-hmm. you, if you took good care of it. Yeah. Now, I had the Kiss dolls. I had all four of them. And they're, they're a couple hundred a piece, I think. Steve Austin, uh, Six Million Dollar Man doll is like $200. So he's still affordable. <laughs> I just remembered this a couple months ago. And I think someone might have posted a picture of one, but I totally forgot. There were these huge... They were... I don't know. They were like... Uh, I want to say they were three feet tall, two and a half feet, mm-hmm. maybe three feet. They were called Shogun Warrior Oh, robots yeah, I've heard of those. From 1977, 78. I had one, and the one you could shoot missiles out of its hands. Mm-hmm. <laughs> My parents caught me this, probably not knowing that I would be shooting these missiles at the dog, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. What are a couple ones that... So, couple of ones that jump off immediately were, you know, video games were a big thing for me in the 90s Mm -hmm. as a kid. So the first one that I really remember opening and being excited about was the Sega Genesis. Okay. I had Mm -hmm. a Nintendo. I had a Super Nintendo. (laughs) But I actually remember getting the Sega Genesis at my mom's house. Mm -hmm. My parents were divorced. So (laughs) a lot of times I had stuff at my dad's house Mm -hmm. and I had stuff at my mom's house. So that was one that I had there that I was able to play. It was new, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So it it gave me something to look forward to when I would go to visit my mom Mm -hmm. on weekends. That was one. I also remember, and it's going to sound so funny, but if you know me, I'm a big sports fan. I got a Barry Sanders jersey. Okay. And nowadays, you know, getting anything is pretty easy to do but Mm -hmm. the detroit lions are nowhere near the state of new jersey yeah so back (laughs) then that was like a chore oh yeah there was no getting there was no ebay yeah you had to find a magazine you'd have to drive (laughs) to detroit (laughs) or drive to michigan (laughs) or you know find a sports store that might have Mm -hmm. maybe the the major players in the nfl at the time but so that that one was a big deal for me i was super happy we actually 
we videotaped Christmas that year and you can just, mm-hmm. you could see how oh, happy wow. I was. That's cool. Yeah. To hold it up and have it. And I still have it to this day. I, I eventually got it signed, but yeah, I wish I had a video from, I have photos, you know? Yeah. The weirdest one I just remembered, I was probably five years old, was this chicken. It was <laughs> chicken and he was wearing like a jumpsuit. I know I could not find this chicken. <laughs> I have no idea who made it. And it had an, it came with an egg. Okay. But it had legs and a chicken head. Like what made my parents get this for me? But I remember loving this chicken doll. <laughs> It had arms and legs and a chicken head. It sounds like something out of the Garfield and Friends. There was like an egg with legs. I don't... If I remember correctly. No, it wasn't. It was like a... It was a human body Ooh. with a chicken head. That's weird. And he was clothed. But I, I swear he was wearing like a like a jumpsuit or something. <laughs> and he had a... And it, it came with an egg. Interesting. Like a solid... Not a real egg, of course. But <laughs> And then there were the... Um, of course, Star Trek figures. Mm-hmm. I have one of them. It's not the it's not the one I had when I was a kid, but it, it, it's it's the one. It's not the exact one I had when I was a kid, but I I can't find them. Of course, I got him like twenty years ago. I found them or whenever eBay started. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the Planet of the Apes dolls. One album though uh, was the River uh, Bruce Springsteen. I got that. My parents actually had to go out to a record store and I picture them not being able to, maybe they saw it there because it was new. Right. But having to, to say Bruce Springsteen, I don't, my dad was, would always mess up words. <laughs> yeah. So I picture them asking for Bryce string bean or something. <laughs> I don't know. One I still have, and I've had it a while, is actually the first gift that my wife got me when we were first going out in 1991, mm-hmm. and it's a Sony Walkman well, there cassette you go. player. Yep. Still works. I still have it. Another um, great gift my wife got me is my beer fridge. Oh, yeah. Which I... I can attest to that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which still works good. Because my, my wife was getting tired of me putting the... The beer in the frigger- refrigerator. Taking up all There's that space. Of, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I like to stock up, you know, for the holidays. Yep. <laughs> I can say, you know, you said the the Walkman. Mm-hmm. One that was on my list that I can remember was my first boombox. It had the mm-hmm. CD player and two cassette players mm-hmm. and the volume control along with like the treble control, you know, just like mm-hmm. it was advanced for its time. We're talking <laughs> early 90, early to mid 90s here. Mm hmm. You know, that was cool because I could record CDs to cassettes mm-hmm. and oh, okay. then yeah. ask my parents to play the cassettes in the car. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, that's something that I've always kind of had held in my memory. But I could also record from, straight from the radio onto the cassette oh, yeah. tapes. Yeah. You know, you had to sit there and listen for your favorite song to come on and hopefully catch it in time. But mm-hmm. the boom box was definitely one of my you know, a big gift that I remember. Yeah, I had a boombox too that I liked. Yeah, I know what you mean. I would record from the radio. I had a, f- a friend who recorded. That. I think he lived in California for a while. Uh, it was probably might have been late eighties, nineties, and I have one of the tapes that he made from the radio. Wow! I just have to go back and listen to it. That's cool. <laughs> See what's on there. One gift is not memorable, but and I remember at the time. Again, I was I was like five or six, mm-hmm. and it wasn't my parents that got me this, but one of my relatives, and it was some kind of kit that had plaster, like a powder, huh. okay, that you mix and you can make bricks out of it, and I guess make I don't know what you can make bricks. <laughs> yeah, it had molds. <laughs> I guess you make a house or something. Oh, okay, that makes sense. But the age on it was older. Yeah, and my parents wouldn't let me play with it until i was older oh geez so i still remember that okay yep not a good memory no but i do have good memories of you know christmas uh my parents i would try and get up early in the morning my parents you know you couldn't open gifts until they were up yeah now we had we had a chimney in the house but we didn't have a fireplace the chimney went into the bathroom closet hmm <laughs> Now, there was no opening. I guess it went to the furnace. Right. So, 
like when I was little, my bedroom was across from the bathroom. So I would imagine Santa coming out of the bathroom. I don't know how he was coming out of the chimney <laughs> right. in the bathroom. But back to, you know, waiting to open gifts. I did, I did the same thing with my son mm-hmm. because he'd want to get up at five, six o'clock in the morning. So when my wife and I would finally get up, my thing was I need to make coffee first. Absolutely. And I keep him waiting. Yep. I feel bad. But we'd always open up one gift, which you still do, uh, Christmas Eve. Yeah. You get to pick one gift. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of cool. We've done that. Uh, yeah. For me, another big one that I remember was my first computer. Mm-hmm. It was 95, actually. I was, I was eight. Okay. And it was, it was becoming a bigger deal. I had the big bulky gateway. <laughs> Uh-huh. <laughs> had like two gigs of memory, mm-hmm. which was a lot. <laughs> you know, you had to put floppy disks in to play oh, games. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. just I, I will always remember that one because that computer was such a nightmare. Mm-hmm. And I always had to call the gateway help oh. number and they would like remotely go into my computer <laughs> to mm-hmm. fix problems. And I was always amazed by that. <laughs> but, you know, obviously I had a gateway laptop. The Internet wasn't than yeah. what it is yeah. now so it was it was very new you had to dial up mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> i remember the first like dell i had and i had a problem with the dvd player mm-hmm. and i called and a guy came to my house and he i think he installed a new dvd player <laughs> i think the last big christmas that i remember as a kid and I say kid. I, I was probably 11 or 12. I don't remember the exact age. I got a trip to Disney World. Oh. So that was that funny was... because you opened up. A, it was actually they ra- they printed out the the travel brochure type of thing mm-hmm. and put it in a clothing box. Okay. Yeah. And put clothes on top of it. Mm-hmm. So, of course, it was kind of like one of those deals where, oh, great, more clothes. And yeah. my dad's like, um you better grab that box and look at it a little closer. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I had to re-grab it and I pulled the, you know, pants out or whatever was in yeah. there. And, you know, I was trying to kind of understand exactly what this printout piece of paper oh, yeah. actually was. And here mm-hmm. it was a week trip to, to Disney World and oh. Oh, an absolute blast. The first time I had ever gone. Was it soon after or was it? Yeah, oh, yeah. we did, we went in March. Oh, okay. So it was only yeah. a couple of months after and it... Definitely, probably mm-hmm. the best Christmas gift I've oh, wow. ever gotten. Yeah, I've never gotten a trip. <laughs> so, yeah. Very cool. Yes. So that does it for part one. And uh, we're going to be back with part two. So part two, is we're going to talk about the movie The Nightmare Before Christmas. We'll also talk a little bit about the soundtrack. You know, got to get music in there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so thanks for listening. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to No Good Music, exit music by the band 99%. Today's show was produced and edited by Jim Thatcher and recorded at the Did You Say 7 Studios in Washington, New Jersey. You can find No Good Music on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Pandora, and almost anywhere you listen to podcasts. 